And welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going to be looking at a game that was played between Dingloren and Abumanu Mishra, currently the world's youngest grandmaster, in the first round of the Chessable Masters being played on Chess24. So without further ado, let's jump right into the game. So the game starts with E4, played by Abumanu. Ding responds with C6, going into the Karo Khan defense. D4, D5. And now Abumanu Mishra plays the move E5, going into the advanced variation. Ding plays Bishop F5 with the idea of playing e6 here and again you end up with the bishop outside of the pawn chain so this makes a lot of sense so after bishop f5 knight to d2 is played here by abamanu mishra in this position we get pawn to e6 played by ding knight to b3 a developing move it opens up the diagonal for the dark square bishop from c1 additionally maybe white tries to prevent black from pushing the pawn from c6 to c5 creating a classic break in the center so now we get knight to d7 played by ding Knight to f3, played by Abumanu Mishra, f6 here, trying to challenge white center with the pawns on e5 and d4. And now here, bishop d3 is played, offering an exchange of the light square bishops. Now this is a very logical move here played by Mishra. The idea is that if black trades the bishops on d3 in this position, it, in this position what we have here is we have a situation where basically after pawn takes pawn on e5, white can take back with the pawn. And now the knight is jumping to d4 here from b3. White also has knight g5 threats as well. And it's a pretty scary position for black. So instead, Ding plays the move bishop to g4. Now we have pawn to h3 being played by Mishra and bishop to h5. Ding does not trade on f3 here because after bishop takes f3, queen takes f3. If you play f takes e5, now white has a very nasty move queen to h5, attacking the king on e8, putting it in check. And now after g6, white can play bishop takes g6, pawn takes g6, queen takes h8. And white is way ahead in material here. Additionally, black is lacking in development, so white should win this position pretty simply. So back to the game after h3, Ding plays bishop h5, keeping the pin from h from the bishop on h5 towards the knight on f3 and towards the queen on d1. So here we get g4 played by Mishra, trying to break up this pin. Now, ordinarily, we tell a lot of players that you do not want to push the pawns on the king side like this with h3 and g4. However, you'll note that white has not cast the king to the king side yet. And additionally, white really wants to try and overprotect this pawn on e5. If you do not play g4, for example, say you play a move like bishop e3, Black can take on e5, and after pawn takes, black can play the move knight takes e5, and you're simply down a pawn because if you capture the knight on e5, now you lose the queen on d1. So instead, g4 is played by Mishra, bishop f7, and now he plays the move bishop f4, developing the dark square bishop. Additionally, at some point, white might want to go queen e2 and castle the king to the queen side, and in such a situation, now playing h3 and g4 makes a lot of sense because the king is not castling to that side of the board. So after bishop f4, a5 is played by ding, and now we get the move a4. Now again, based on the way that white has pushed the pawns on the king side and the fact that white intends to go queen e2 and castle queen side, it's a little bit questionable whether a5 is a good move or not because it does create a weakness on the queen side, especially if black wishes to move the queen to say b6 and castle to the queen side because now the pawn on a5 will always be a weakness. So after a4, knight to e7 is played here by ding. Mishra plays queen e2. Developing the queen, trying to castle the queen side. Additionally, you might try to do something on the e-file down the road with e takes f6 and having the queen on e2. So now knight g6 is played by ding, attacking the bishop on f4. We get bishop to g3. Ding plays bishop b4 check. Now the idea be behind this move is simply to force white to push a pawn and create a weakness with the knight on b3 being weak. So now we get c3. Bishop to e7 is played here. And now h4 is played by Mishra, again, delaying this queenside castling because he realizes that he can still take more space on the king side. So Ding goes queen b6 here, logical move, attacks the knight on b3 with the queen on b6. Additionally, he prepares to castle the king to the queen side. So now we get knight b to d2, h5 is played by Ding, not queen takes b2 because after queen takes b2, rook b1, let's just say queen c3 for example. Now after e takes f6, g takes f6, and a move like h5, or even a move like castles here, black is in a lot of trouble. Computer actually thinks this is already completely lost. So instead, Ding plays h5, trying to prevent this pawn push. Now Mishra takes on f6. Ding captures back with the pawn. He does not take with the knight, for example, because after knight takes, now white can go g5. Let's just say you go knight d7 here. And after white castles to the queen side, you have a serious problem here. First of all, there's a square on e5 for the knight to create an outpost. Additionally, you have weaknesses on e6. Your knight on g6 is also a little bit weak here. So it's a very, very tough position here for black to play. So g takes f6 is played by ding. Now we get the move pawn to g5, played by Mishra. 
Now, the point behind this move is essentially to try and take control of this e5 square. If black plays f5, there's always this option to jump to e5 with the knight at some point. And black will also have trouble playing a move like e5 because now I trade the pawns on f6 here. And then after pawn takes pawn, once again, black is simply lost. So instead, we get castles played by Ding, Mishra castles as well. Rook e8 is played by Ding Loren. Rook e1, just logical moves, putting the rooks on the open e file here for both sides and now here ding plays the very committal move pawn to e5 and asks mishra what is the plan so we got pawn takes pawn pawn takes pawn and there are a bunch of exchanges here knight takes pawn knight takes bishop takes bishop takes g5 here idea being that now you're attacking the bishop on e5 with both the rook and the knight the rook on e8 and the knight on d7 so white takes back knight takes e5 is played here bishop f5 check king d8 and now f4 played by Mishra, knight g6. Not knight c4, by the way. Knight c4 looks like a very logical move because if you move the queen to, let's just say, f3, there's queen takes b2 check here. And after king d1, queen takes d2 would be checkmate. However, after a move like knight c4, white can actually play the move knight takes knight. And now if you capture the queen on e2, I simply take the queen on b6, and I'm winning the game. So instead, knight g6 is played here. Now we get queen to f3, rook h f8, and bishop c2 is played here by by um by mishra now in this position after this move bishop c2 we'll notice a lot of the smoke is cleared it's a kind of a weird position because even though material is even here we have a big imbalance black has pawns on d5 and h5 while white has connected past pawns on f4 and g5 additionally white's king here is very very safe so long term white should be technically winning here with the connected past pawns so ding trades the rooks on e1 and plays the move rook e8 and here Mishra, Mishra plays a move that I'm not a huge fan of. He plays a move Rook takes e8. Now, in such a position, it's very, very logical to think that with the two connected pass pawns, you'll be able to trade down and push the pawns up the board and win the game. But the one thing in this end game is that Black's king on d8, it is relatively close to the g8 square. It's only three squares away. And so the king can get over very, very quickly. So I think that Rook takes Rook was maybe a move that was played a little bit too hastily by Mishra here. I think he should have kept the Rooks on the board with the move Rook to f1. Because after rook to f1 here, black has a couple options. If you play rook e3, for example, now white can simply go queen to f2. And this pin is a big problem. Additionally, I have f5, g6 again, which should be winning here. And if black tries to move like queen e3 to trade the queens after you trade, now you can push f5, knight to e5, g6, bishop e8. Not bishop g8, by the way, because then f6 would once again be winning in this position because the bishop on c2 protects the pawn on g6. And you're just going to go f7. And you'll win a lot of material on the next move. So instead you go bishop e8 so now if f6 black can just take the pawn but after a move like g7 bishop f7 f6 again with ideas like bishop h7 coming in maybe even rook g1 the two protected pass pawns way up the board this should be a technical win for white here so this was a big mistake by mishra to not trade the rooks nonetheless the position is still probably winning so instead he trades the rooks on e8 bishop take e8 is played and now he plays a move that i really don't like he plays this move bishop takes g6 and while this is still winning here after bishop g6 f5 bishop to e8 you'll notice that it's going to be hard to push these two pawns up the board the f5 pawn and the g5 pawn additionally your king is a little bit weak here there are moves like queen g1 just to illustrate a point let's just say you play some random moves here um that, that don't blunt actually queen f4 is playing the game so let's let me play another random move say you got some position like queen h1 queen f2 f6 for example now their idea is like c5 to attack the pawn on a4. There are also ideas like bishop g6 to create threats on this light square diagonal. So it's very tricky to play at this point. So after bishop e8 here, Mishra plays the move queen to f4, trying to protect both the pawn on a4, but also the pawn on g5 here. So now we get queen g1 played by Ding Loren, king c2. And now Ding plays a very tricky move here, which is the move queen to g4, offering the trade of the queens in this position. So after queen g4 is played, it's a very tough spot here. Because if you look at this position, intuitively to me, even when I look, looked at it for the first time earlier, it I thought that after queen takes, pawn takes, king d3, you figure two protected pass pawns here. King should get to f4. This should be winning for white. But it's not quite that simple. However, in this position, the, the winning, winning line here for white would have been to play the move queen to d6 check, king to c8, and now you go queen to f8 here. You guard the pawn at f5. You also pin the bishop on e8. And you also are starting to threaten to push your f and g pawns up the board now it's very easy to reject a line like this because you figure well first of all black is queen takes a4 and where's the, how, how do you win the game but after queen a4 you can play the move pawn to b3 queen to a2 king to d3 and now your knight creates a sort of shield here 
it's covering all these critical squares around the king and now after move like king d7 simply g6 followed by g7 and white will win the game so after king c8 queen f8 black cannot take the pawn on a4 so another move that black can try is king d7 but once again after king d7 white goes g6 and if black tries to sacrifice here after queen g7 check you simply are going to win the bishop on g6 and with it you will win the game here after a move like knight f3 king f6 knight to h4 and you guard the pawn on g6 so this is simply winning for winning for white here however white does trade and now Misha plays this move knight to f1 now once again it's particular, particularly strange to me why he did not play king d3 because after king d3 king e7 king e3 when black goes c5 you go king f4 bishop takes a4 king takes g4 and this is actually winning winning for white long term the reason being that after say bishop c2 king f4 black goes b5 king e5 black plays a4 you can now go f6 check here king f7 and you simply take the pawns and you're just in time here after b4 because you can play this very nice move knight to c4 preventing the pawn push to a3 you also have the idea of knight to e5 checking the king on f7 now once again very very long line very very difficult to find it's definitely not something that i would expect a player to, to spot with a few minutes on the clock but it would have been the best move to play because after knight f1 is played here king e7 king d3 king d6 even though the knight stops a g4 pawn from going to g3 now black's king gets to e5 before your king gets to f4 or even d4 because on king d4 i go c5 check followed by king e5 so knight e3 is played here ding plays king e5 and now g6 played by mishra pawn to g3 played by ding if you go g7 here i can simply go bishop f7 to stop the pawn push so king e2 is played with the idea of king f3 but now black can go king f4 here and once again you'll notice that when you push the pawn say g7 after bishop f7 f6 i can very simply go move like king g5 to eat the two pawns on f6 and g7 so after after king f4 here we got b3 played by mishra b6 and now he plays b4 logical move you really don't want to push any of your pawns you can't really move the king because you lose your knight on e3 and if you move the knight you also lose the pawn on f5 so you're kind of stuck here you don't have many moves so b4 is very reasonable now we get this move pawn to d4 and now g7 is played here by mishra a big mistake considering the time considering the situation on the board what he should have done is he should have played this move pawn takes a5 because now after d takes e3 you can take on b6 g2 b7 g1 queen b8 queen and after king f5 queen takes e8 this should lead to a draw after queen d2 king d3 check king c4 and queen a2 check maybe even e2 is also a draw but black doesn't have anything better than that however here Mishra makes a critical blunder which is he plays the wrong order he plays the move pawn to g7 and now after bishop f7 he plays this move pawn takes pawn if you take on d4 here black will take on b4 and get the wide peepos the pawns which are split too far from the b file to g file so he tries to play this move b takes a5 now but unfortunately in this order it doesn't work because after d takes e3 a takes b6 g2 b7 because white has played played g7 bishop f7 now black has a crushing move bishop c4 check here and in this position mishra resigns because now the king has to go to the back rank d1 or e1 and now the queen will be with check or checkmate and white is simply lost so very very unfortunate game for mishra he played really really well played the opening extremely well he was definitely better for most of the game showing that he can compete with the best players in the world but one of the things that the top players do that a lot of players maybe a little bit lower lower level gms aren't able to do is they're able to keep looking for resource keep fighting and never giving up so even though mishra got a big advantage out of the opening he was able to maintain it for much of the middle game and into the early end game he wasn't able to play a completely full game and for that reason he ends up making a blunder and losing this very tough game to ding loren in the first round of the chessball masters once again i hope you guys enjoyed this recap uh, I obviously have not been doing a lot of streaming. I've been doing a lot of videos, but in this period of time when I'm going to be preparing for the Canis, which is coming up very, very soon in about one month, I will do, be doing more YouTube only content. So you guys will be getting a lot more recaps and videos of this nature, maybe some vlogs as well, potentially, depending on what I'm doing um, as part of my training. But I hope you guys enjoy this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button below, and I will see you guys very soon.